And welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine, mental health, and the keys to a life well lived. I'm clinical psychologist Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co host, Dr. Reed Robison, and I wade into finding your purpose. We come at this belabored topic from a few different angles and try to freshen it up for you a little bit. We talk about how psychedelics tend to influence one's thoughts around meaning and purpose in life. We also go on a provocative tangent, at least I thought it was kind of provocative, about mental health stigma related to diagnostic labels. So love it, hate it, or indifferent, we would love to hear from you. Please email us your questions and suggestions at psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. I worked really hard on this episode, okay, so please enjoy it. I know I say that at the end of any, every intro, but uh, you know I mean it. I get You don't have to enjoy it. This is an invitation to enjoy it. So I invite you to enjoy the episode. Did that sound needy? kind of did. Anyway, uh, enjoy. All right, welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers. It's another episode with just me and just Reed. But Howdy, Steve. I, I think it does us a disservice to say just... I mean, yeah, cut that out. You're pretty awesome. <laughs> now you say likewise. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I thought we could do a meandering conversation on meaning, purpose, how we define success in this life. Just, uh, Not just a, those little, just topics. those little things. Yeah. yeah, nothing, nothing too deep, nothing too complicated. I'm down. Yeah, I know this is something that I. Uh, I've probably thought about way too much in my life and fretted over a lot, but I bet a lot of our listeners can relate. Man's search for meaning. There you go. Yeah. I, you know, there's a lot of YouTube videos and, and a lot of smart, wise, and probably some not so smart, not so wise people rendering opinions about this and the pro- and have even before YouTube. Imagine that like thousands of years ago, we have ancient philosophers making comments about the meaning of life, right? Like Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. yeah. Pre-YouTube. Seneca, yeah, pre-YouTube, for sure. So I don't know that you and I are going to solve any of these ancient problems or answer any of these ancient questions today, but who knows? We're pretty awesome. We'll we'll give it a shot. We can give our unenlightened opinions just for fun. Yeah. But for me, I know that, um, and maybe this is an artifact of just my generation of being, you know, uh, tail end of the millennial generation in America, but feeling like I had to find my purpose in life and it had to align with my career and I had to be in purpose and I had to be working within this zone of, of, uh, (laughs) meaning and at any moment spent not, you know, in alignment with my purpose was a moment wasted. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And for an overthinker like myself, like not knowing, quote unquote, knowing what my purpose was caused a lot of distress for me. Um, And people can derive purpose from a lot of different sources. Maybe we could talk about that. Like when we say, when people say like, what is my purpose? What kind of question are they asking? And where do they typically get the answers, do you think? They might just be having a midlife crisis. Yeah. (laughs) Or quarter life or (laughs) an awakening, right? Or starting to question those tightly held uh, core beliefs or social conditioning, perhaps, or Mm -hmm. starting to feel that dissonance, uh, that discomfort with um, trying to be someone you're not or trying to live in um, opposition to your true essence, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm when those questions really start to come up, although the questions are also deeply ingrained from our Western culture that is very goal-seeking. Right. Yeah, goal-seeking, and then your value is measured by what you achieve, or it's yeah. measured by how much money you make or how popular you are. It's a dangerous uh, belief, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, I really like the Eastern take on things, or. Uh, or how people in the West uh, help translate those Eastern ideals for us Westerners, like Alan Watts, for example, mm. who he'd say, F your purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Just the purpose of life is to live, or the purpose of life is to be alive and really be present 
And he likes to point out how a musician, say an expert violinist, would not uh, have the goal of finishing the song or getting the end. The goal is to play the song mm. beautifully and with presence. Um, same with dancers, for example. Right. Yeah, being in love with the process. You know, that's an insight that I had um, during a psychedelic experience where I went in deliberately asking the medicine, uh, well, I asked a lot of questions like, is there a God? And <laughs> what is my purpose? Those are loaded questions. What is the purpose of life? Yeah, lots of loaded questions. And I got the kinds of answers you would expect from a psychedelic trip. I got, you know, sure there's a God, you're God. Everyone's God. God is the earth. God is the air you <laughs> breathe. You know, God gotcha is... Mama. Yeah, yeah. And then to the, to the question, what is the purpose of life or what is my purpose? I got something qu quite a bit like that, that it's the, the purpose is to journey. You know, the, mm -hmm. the purpose of a journey is not to reach the destination. I've used this metaphor before about climbing mountains. I could hire a helicopter pilot to drop me off on the top of a mountain. It would be pretty cool. But it wouldn't be the same kind of experience as actually climbing the mountain. And you spend 30 minutes on the summit, you're kind of done being on the summit. You yeah. know, you've accomplished yeah. your goal. The, the point is to climb. You know, life, uh, to, to journey, journey is a verb. It's something you're doing. It's not something you accomplish. Yeah, I think that's a key takeaway right there mm -hmm. for finding your purpose is be careful with the question. Be careful with trying too hard to find your purpose. Mm -hmm. I really like how the movie Soul, Disney Pixar's, mm. uh, shines a light on this. Have you seen it? I haven't. Yeah. No. It's, uh, it's a good one because it, to me, it highlights that uh, your purpose can and does likely change through life. And if you attach yourself too much to one purpose or outcome or goal, then that's a risky place to be. Mm. You know, I, at times in my life, I've found myself jealous of people who appear to have a singular purpose because it seems, mm -hmm. and it just seems from observing these human beings from the outside that they just have it figured out and how lucky they are to just have this singular purpose in life. Because, you know, if ever there is a question about whether or not they should be doing one thing versus another, they can throw it up against that metric of, well, is it in line with, you know, my purpose in life to do X, Y, or Z? If yes, then it's a hell yes. If no, then it's a hell mm -hmm. no. Yeah, and and I like that. I think it's it's one of these situations, which is probably all of the situations we talk about, where there can be two truths, mm -hmm. um, uh, two kind of seemingly uh, contradicting ideas that are both true. Like, yes, you can feel deep into your truest, deepest self and uh, find your purpose and you can be unattached to the outcome because if you're trying too hard, that's trouble. Um, and your purpose can change. Like, But there is something to be said about uh, living your current most true purpose to its fullest expression. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because you said it again at the beginning of the the podcast something about your your truest self um and that's something i think r related to this question what is my purpose mm -hmm. and that is who am i who, who what like what is the nature of my truest self and how do i discover it and if i if it if it is something to discover and then how do i um make sure that my i live my life in alignment with my highest truest most authentic self mm -hmm. And I, I like to break it down to two things, uh, two parts of finding your purpose. Know yourself and, well, the, to quote Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss. Mm. Like, what is alive in you? What lights you up? What's your passion? Yeah. Um, but you do have to know that about yourself or cut through the BS that's layered on us or conditioned. Um, so it's not your parents' uh, purpose for you imposed on you from uh, an early age. Yeah. Yeah. So that leads into like questions you can ask yourself to um, guide you to that insight. Like what lights you up inside? Mm -hmm. What would you like to answer questions about even if you were tired? You know, yeah. what, what, um, 
what pain in your younger self would you love to have spared him from? <laughs> and, you know, dedicate your life to finding people who are in that kind of pain and sparing them from it because of what you've learned. Yeah. Having gone through that experience. There's this guy, Jonathan Fields, who has a website called, I think it's the Sparkotype. And he wrote a book hmm. called, oh, I think I wrote it the down. The Sparkotype. I yeah. Like that. Sparked is his book. He has, his podcast okay. called The Good Life Project. Mm-hmm. But so he created this, it's kind of like an interest inventory or a personality test. Yeah. You know, it's a play on the union archetype. But uh, the idea is like, what sparks you? What kind of person are you? Um, based on your answers to these 80 or so questions and what uh, sparks those types of people. And he gives you a primary spark type and then a shadow spark type, but not shadow in the union sense. This is just mm-hmm. kind of the one that is subordinate to the primary yeah. one that serves the primary one. And then uh, in his most recent update to the data, he has like an anti spark type, something that, you know, douses your spark that you might <laughs> want to run from. And this isn't like your Facebook uh, Harry Potter, which Harry Potter character are you quiz? He do, he has good psychometrics. He has a lot of hmm. data that he bases this on. He's done factor analysis and all that stuff. So I'll put it in the show notes, but it's cool. It's uh, it it syncs up with kind of what we're talking about. Who am I at my core? You know, and what kinds of things light me up? Uh, this little personality test can help elucidate some of that. Yeah, I, I like the questions you mentioned or those ways of finding your bliss mm-hmm. like what would you like to talk about even if you're tired or uh, i've brought those kind of exercises and writing exercises into a lot of therapy sessions a lot of group therapy sessions um, and sometimes the exercise like people might draw a blank when looking for who they are or what is my purpose um, or you could even start by writing life is meaningless like that's okay. Like it sounds uh, nihilistic, but mm-hmm. you can start anywhere. Just grease the wheels. I like blank and just start writing. And I, I like to remind people that it's going to take most people 50 to a hundred things. You fill a page before yeah. you quit. And when you get to resistance, like this is boring. I, I hate this. Oh, you're on to something. Mm-hmm. That's when you keep going. Um, in terms of like finding out who you are, what what lights you up, what is alive inside of you somewhere. Yeah, keep asking yourself why. You know, there's that, uh, we were talking about before we hit record, um, Simon Sinek's TED Talk, the Start With Why. Mm-hmm. He maybe even wrote a book of, by that title. Um, yeah, The but Power of Why. Yeah, he's got this golden circle, right? This These three layers, but at the center of that circle is your why. Why are you doing it? And then just outside that, the next layer, I think, is it's either how or what. Yeah, how. Is it how? And then the most uh, the, the outermost ring is what. Yeah. You know, um, why are you doing this? People don't pay you or purchase your product because of what you've created. They, they buy your why. Yeah. People often know what they do. Often they even know how they do it. But a lot of the time we're disconnected from the why, mm-hmm. that purpose-driven innermost part of what's making us tick yeah yeah and i think it's a really good exercise if you're trying to figure out you know where do you fall around these questions about purpose and meaning um and you're you're, you know you're doing your journey thing but what are the different stops on your journey what does the nature of the trail look like Mm -hmm. well some of that is constructed by how you answer that question of you know what's your why Mm -hmm. And remembering that the negative parts of life are very important steps on the journey as well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe the most important steps. We talk Mm -hmm. about that a lot on this podcast, and it's partly because we're both mental health professionals and we have people who come to us in distress all the time. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of negativity. And so we're trying to help them metabolize and deal with and understand and contextualize that pain or suffering. Um, but yeah, this idea that uh, triggers our friends to follow, like you often say, and, um, and like we talked about in one of our most recent episodes about struggle and the value of struggle, uh, that your why, ooh, here's another quote I'm going to butcher, but if you know your why, you can overcome almost any how, or you can endure almost yeah. any what, if you have a good sense of what your why is. 
Yeah, it's that meaning and those values that anchor you uh, and help you forge ahead through the difficult stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and now I'm I'm suddenly thoughtful of those people who um, you know maybe don't have the luxury of wondering about their why a whole mm-hmm. lot because you know they have to go work in the salt mine and make just enough money to make sure their family doesn't starve to death. But as I say it, that's a pretty compelling why. <laughs> yeah. Like, why am I going into the salt mine? Well, it's the best I got, unfortunately, but it, uh, and I have to keep my family alive. Yeah, one of my favorite books that was really transformative for me on my journey is a good one that speaks to that. It's Viktor Frankl's mm. Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah. That, uh, yeah. that reminds me. It's one of those that I have on my list of books to revisit every couple of years and I'm overdue for a a reread of that one yeah yeah I mean it's uh it's a book that's cited often just because of how powerful it is when you have somebody you know a psychiatrist who went through not one but two different I think concentration camps Mm -hmm. um and lost his family and just experienced so much suffering so much pain to come out of there I mean deeply wounded but also with this amazing perspective that while they can take you know uh, evil people in this world can take so much from you what they can't take is what you hold inside your head you know your perspective your why yeah yeah, yeah. and th- another disclaimer that i like to give because we we talk about follow your bliss mm-hmm. which i love i love joseph campbell's um description of that and we can get into the details but even before that um I heard, I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert give a talk once, and she got up and she said, I'm sorry for telling you to go find your purpose and follow your bliss, or however she put it. Uh, She's like, I realize that some days it's hard to just get out of bed. And how about this? How about follow your curiosity Mm. (laughs) as a stepping stone? I love that because when I, for those perfectionists in our audience, like, the idea that you have to find your purpose, like I was kind of referencing before, and um, I don't want to waste any time. I don't yeah. know my purpose. Oh my gosh, I'm I'm 18. I'm starting college. I don't know what my majors should be, and it needs to be purpose driven and oriented and all that stuff. Um, following your curiosity is liberating. Yeah. If you can just like, well, I'm curious about this. Like when I was in when I started college, I was curious about the humanities and English. My dad was a creative writing professor, an English professor, and he was trying to dissuade me from doing that. You can't make any money as a creative <laughs> writing professor. As baby boomers tend to do. Right. right. Well, he's older than a boomer. Um, he was a greatest generation guy. Hmm. Yeah, I have I have the, the distinction of, I think my dad was in his 50s when I was born. He was born in 1929. Oh, wow. Professor Thayer. Um, professor Thayer. Yeah. It was, yeah, to have a boomer mom and a greatest generation dad. 20, 20 years older than my mom. Yeah, interesting perspectives there on on purpose. Because um, he was a very duty-driven dude. You know, mm-hmm. it was be safe, uh, don't do anything that would jeopardize the well-being of your family, and do your duty. Uh, and I, 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 um, I really value a lot of the, I guess, the conditioning and programming I got from my dad, a lot of it. I think it helps. It has helped me be resilient and get through a lot of hard times. Um, but maybe has prevented me from being a little bit more flexible to sort of mm-hmm. follow your curiosity thing we were talking about. Because it is a balance. There, There is a need for discipline along the way. You can't just be all formless. <laughs> you mm-hmm. got to be some form, like we've talked about in the kind of Eastern philosophical ways. But it's a yin-yang balance of, uh, of doing and non-doing or mm-hmm. being flexible and also... Uh, purpose driven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And when you can be a little formless and explore the the corners of that form and be curious, you can discover things that maybe, maybe sync up with your why mm-hmm. that you weren't privy to before. And the pendulum does swing in society. Like we see in the differences in the generations, like you're talking about from how you were raised. If you're a baby boomer versus millennials and younger um and there's certainly a balance and there's a lot to learn from each but i've i've been 
learned a lot from the younger generation, my kids, about abandoning the social conditioning and not caring about um, the income, the why, the goal, and more being concerned about how to live fully in the present and take care of our planet and things like that. Yeah, it's interesting to see how priorities change when people seem to live more fully in the present. Nothing wrong with having a goal. Nothing wrong with wanting to achieve something, with wanting to change the state that you're in in the future, right? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But it is interesting to see how more, how much more compassionate people seem to get toward one another, how much more concerned they seem to be about this planet when they are living more in the present. Mm -hmm. And even back 2,000 years ago, we mentioned Marcus Aurelius, one of the Stoics, mm -hmm. Uh, what third century BC or something like that? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, that was another formative book for me along the way. Was his book called Meditations? Meditations but, yeah. but we think of the Stoics as that like aggressive, grab life by the horns approach. But really, if you look at uh, Marcus Aurelius's writing on finding your purpose, one of the key points was your purpose is your present and your duty is to be here now and be mm. fully here. And uh, yeah, there's some discipline needed along the way. And yeah, ignore the haters. <laughs> but, uh, but it did include that more balanced component of your purpose is your present moment, not what happens after you finish college. Right. Yeah, the tool that I've been using the most recently to wake up to who I am and uh, the be and be here now is is mindfulness meditation, mm -hmm. and I've been using Sam Harris's Waking Up Course, his app, to I do like that. that. Um, and I know there are some people who hate Sam, people who love Sam. I I, I, I think he's a really really interesting person. He comes at this uh, idea of spirituality and understanding the nature of the mind from an aggressively secular position, you know, mm -hmm. um, he's very much an atheist has written much about his criticisms of religion. Um, and he's a, he's a neuroscientist and he's a, 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 a practitioner. I mean, he spent, I think at a, at a accumulated over a year in silent retreat mm -hmm. at least. That's a lot, which is a lot for some just, you know, dude from, the U.S. How long have you spent in silence? <laughs> Not that <laughs> much. It's kind of funny to look at the comparison. That's a long time. Yeah. yeah. And he's had, he has a lot of insights. Uh, I've been yeah. listening to some of his lessons on his app about paradoxes and the illusory self. And he's really mm -hmm. controversial about his thoughts about free will. He happens to think we are in a deterministic universe and that free will is an illusion. And such a complicated concept to understand. But yeah, um, so there's all that. But uh, certainly his, his meditation guidance there, he does this thing, which you know you'll, you're probably very familiar with, but as as a meditation neophyte, it's been interesting for me, where you're in a mindfulness meditation and you're becoming aware of the contents of consciousness. Maybe you're focusing on the breath or a sound, and then he has you look for the looker. He has yeah, you I try to that. turn the lens back on where this is all emanating from, and that is trippy as hell, because you don't find anything. You know what you find is either just, I don't know how to do that, or you find that it's all just this amorphous cloud of consciousness. Mm -hmm. That's uh, what they'd call in the yogic circles, uh, the seeker becomes the seer. Mm. Or that is, I think, one of the tricks or hacks to touching into that more enlightened perspective. Enlightenment, I like to define as just a radical shift in perspective. But when the seeker becomes a seer, you realize that there is that looker. Mm -hmm. That is one of the most powerful reminders I've ever seen to get out of my head, get out of my ego, and into this more loving awareness kind of state. Right. Yeah, I was trying to explain to my wife yesterday why I seem more happy. <laughs> <laughs> Cause but my, my son said, you know, he, he came back from his therapy appointment. He said, dad, I, I got a diagnosis. He was all excited about having Yay. a diagnosis. <laughs> my therapist says I have MDD. He says with a smile. Um, and so I said, well, do you know what that means? And he's like, well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a conversation at the dinner table about everyone's diagnoses, right? For better or worse. And, um, you know, I said, you know, I've been diagnosed with MDD before in my life, uh, along with some other things. Here's what it means to have a, a diagnosis. I'm doing air quotes for people who are just listening. Um, and here's why you don't see dad really sad a lot 
anymore. But I, I found it really difficult to, to, to explain mm-hmm. um, and difficult to help my clients understand what mindfulness, when practiced well, whatever that means, um, really can free you from. We yeah. made the distinction between pain and suffering in our last episode. It, it really can free you from the suffering, the unnecessary suffering caused by an over-identification with just your thoughts. Because what is a thought? Mm-hmm. Or over-identification with a diagnosis or those labels. Yeah, a label, like, a story, you know. I love that you had that open conversation with your son about it because I do think that's a risk in our profession uh, and in mental health in general. Like We have these labels for a number of reasons you know Mm -hmm. it's helped us to have diagnostic categories to study the conditions and find new therapies and test them in a similar group of people and do some actual like statistics on it to to get big insurance companies to pay for your treatment yeah there there are so many reasons but it's important to point out that this is not the absolute truth these are our best possible with our current level of understanding, which is still pretty small Mm -hmm. way of describing a common set of symptoms. And it's not even completely biologically informed or the, you know, end all be all of, you know, what someone is like those labels you have to take with a major grain of salt. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm treading on thin ice here. Um, but I am a little concerned about in our efforts to, I want to be careful here. Brace yourselves, people. <laughs> In our efforts to reduce stigma around mental illness, I'm a little concerned that we are encouraging people to over-identify with their diagnostic labels. Yeah. So like, I have ADHD and you know, you're going to have to accommodate me because of my ADHD and I can't help this. It's a disease just like cancer, just like a bacterial infection. My medicine is not unlike insulin for diabetes. And to some extent, everything I just said could be true, but I think there is a danger in over-identification and being then limited by a label that, folks, if, if you don't know how the DSM was created, you might be kind of shocked. <laughs> it's not like it was, uh, Moses didn't bring it down from Mount Sinai. It's updated a, you know, quite a bit every decade or so by just a, a group of people who are smart and who do their research, but there is some... Well, it's not without its criticism. It's I'll leave it at that. Created by uh, sitting around a table much like this and talking about, uh, you know, what we see in the field and yeah. like gathering all the data possible. But I, uh, when I entered this profession, you know, it took me a minute as well to come to terms with it because there is that dark side of diagnosis. But as a researcher, a couple hundred clinical trials later, Mm -hmm. I see the value and all the insurance approvals we're able to get to open up access to people thanks to diagnosis. um, Great. But what you said, I think is really important. And uh, when I entered psychiatry, uh, I thought, hey, this DSM, DSM three or four or whatever it was back then, now we're up to number five, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental conditions Mm -hmm. it's more like a bird watching guide for humans like that kind of sounds a little bit silly or facetious or critical but um we're just trying the best we can as a field to talk the same language and that practice of non-identification with the diagnosis i think is so important uh because there's a balanced approach to this like use the use the diagnosis for what it's intended for Mm -hmm. and also let go of it um, in terms of uh, living your life and not getting bogged down by it or um, burdened by the diagnosis. Yeah. And you see people in our, in our field making efforts in that vein. Like we don't call, you know, people who've been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, we don't call them borderlines anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we don't call people depressives or schizophrenics when we're trying to be careful, right? We call them people who've been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And I know um, for those of you that are annoyed about PC culture or whatever you want to call it, like you might be annoyed with the longer 
phrase. Like I can't just say borderline. I have to say a person who's been diagnosed mm-hmm. with borderline personality disorder or, or whatever. But um, really, it's it's because we we don't want to label people, and we don't want them to be burdened by labels. We want people to be free, freed and destigmatized um, by the the truth that is, your mental illness is a real thing, or your psychological condition is a real thing but you don't have to feel tied down or limited by it. Yeah. You know, we, we supervise, teach, and train a lot of clinicians, mm-hmm. right? And we often get the question of how do you uh, go there with a client who you think meets criteria for, say, borderline personality disorder? One of the conditions that may have a, a stigma attached to it, uh, unfortunately, um, how do you go there and isn't, there's a fear that it might automatically make someone feel shame or uh, denial, but I don't think that's the case. I think if approached in this way of like, we're walking each other home, we're collaborating with our clients in their healing journey. Um, when we find something that fits, it can be empowering mm-hmm. to the individual to see, oh, that opens up this list of options for me right like i can go to a dbt group or dbt therapist and learn these kind of mindfulness and emotion regulation skills oh i can see how this stems from these deep attachment wounds of my childhood and is showing up in these ways in my life and we often forget that the majority of people with borderline personality disorder grow like they age out of it or they resolve it with therapy over right. time and it's not uh it's not a forever label that uh should come along with it what society often um layers on yeah yeah what you said is a, it's a great demonstration of the utility of a diagnostic label um and then some of the the limitations of a diagnostic label you know? <laughs> I, I once did some math on the criteria this is probably dsm4 era but I was I had a professor in med school or residency who said everyone can be borderline if borderline mm-hmm. if uh, under enough stress or pressure and and I believe we all are like pressure cookers or we all have our breaking point or uh, times in our life where if we're not letting off steam in healthy adaptive ways it might blow up in a way that could be dramatic and and that may not be borderline personality disorder full criteria for most people but um, it does depend on uh, the situation how we uniquely display our stress but I once did the math with the different like five of the nine of this criteria and this and that and realized that there are like 256 flavors of borderline personality disorder right. that you could have it means many different things and our diagnoses still uh there's a lot of work to do to yeah. get uh more and more accurate <laughs> and people are doing that work and i think it will they will continue to get more and more accurate and i think there's utility in that because when you have <clears throat> an accurate as accurate as it can be diagnosis like borderline personality disorder uh, to piggyback on the points you've already made read it, it lets you know, this, this is what I've had clients tell me at least, like once I've rendered the diagnosis mm-hmm. and there's that mixture of like, oh crap and oh, relief, is that I'm not alone. I'm not quote unquote just crazy. There is actually a, a name for what I've been experiencing mm-hmm. and there's other people who experience it. And maybe because there's a name for what I'm experiencing, um, there's hope, there's treatment for it and there's a possibility of recovery. That's huge because... We've talked about this before, perhaps on the podcast, but I like to point it out often in that when in a deep, dark place, say um, hopeless or you can't see your way out, there's a lot we can do by just helping an individual see and feel that they're not alone in this. Like say you're wishing to not be alive is half, uh, um, this is so overwhelming and half no one knows what it's like i feel so alone that part we can tackle really efficiently in uh in group settings or helping people 
uh, with the kinds of things you're talking about, like even with a diagnosis that mm -hmm. opens up that that uh, sense of community. Oh, there is help. There are others who have struggled and overcome. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps reduce the stigma of needing help from peers or from a therapist, from mm -hmm. needing help from a medicine. Um, I know for a lot of people, especially on the medicine front, you know, they, because I'm a therapist, I don't prescribe the medicines. I have the conversations with people when they're like, you know, I just don't want to be on a medicine my whole life. I don't feel like I should need to be on a medicine my whole life. And, you know, our medicines aren't amazing. Uh, for some people, they're life-saving and life-changing. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, they're frustrating and inadequate. And that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about psychedelic-assisted therapy. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are some things. We have we have discovered there are some things that can go wrong with the, the giant, wet, sloppy computer in your skull that we can address <laughs> with some electric you know, uh, some uh, chemical interventions, some electromagnetic intervention, dietary intervention, you know, direct physical interventions on the brain that can really make a difference. And in that way, your mental mm. illness is really not unlike a bacterial infection. Yeah, I think that's an important point too. Like we, we do need to not identify too much with the labels and we also need to reduce this take the stigma out of getting help for mental health conditions because it shouldn't be any harder to get treatment for your mdd than it is for you to get treatment for diabetes right, right? and it shouldn't be any more judged or stigmatized by society like it shouldn't but it is and sadly the majority of people with major depressive disorder don't get access to treatment whether it's talk therapy or electromagnetic uh, like transcranial stimulation right. uh, or psychedelic medicine right which brings me for full circle back to purpose mm -hmm. um, in the interest of reducing stigma and talking about purpose and meaning in life folks do you know why Steve Thayer became a psychologist I mean the answer to why is multifaceted but one of those answers is I was a miserable teenager and I didn't have any quote unquote good reason to be miserable. Hmm. But you ask my family, I remember when I was engaged to my wife, she was talking to my sister or my mom, I can't remember which. And they said, oh, you know, Steve, he's the Eeyore of the family. Hmm. And she thought to herself, well, that's kind of rude. <laughs> um, but then she learned kind of why. <clears throat> I was a very depressed teenager and a very anxious teenager. And, but I was very observant and I cared a lot about people and wanted to figure out why my mind was the way that it was. And it got me interested in philosophy early in life, studied a lot of philosophy. Um, and I wasn't, I was a good listener and I wasn't shy about sharing how I felt with people either. And, um, and so that sort of found, I found my way to psychology in college in the pursuit of trying to figure out my, my stuff and trying to help people who suffered in a similar way. Um, so you'll find as you seek mental health care, that a lot of your providers are people who have struggled themselves. Uh, I often heard that psychological research should be called psychological me-search, because a lot of people mm -hmm. who get into it are really trying to figure things out either about themselves or about close loved ones that, that have suffered. Um, we are definitely all in this together. Yeah, and that, I think, is a key point, because people often take that too far in terms of um, alienating themselves from some help that they might that might be useful to them in saying that oh the mental health profession is just uh, people who are crazy and went into it right. or something like that but but we all are crazy mm -hmm. right we all have our own crazy that's what makes life so interesting mm -hmm. and fun and we all have work to do and I think what you're describing is that uh, willingness to admit it and go there yourself and share it with others and go deep and then take others through that journey. Yeah. I'm out and proud as a crazy person. I'm <laughs> in the sense that, like you said, we're all crazy. We all have our moments. I've never been happier though. I can, I can, I'm happy to celebrate that with all of you listeners that I'm in a good spot. I have a lot to be thankful for, but it doesn't mean I don't still experience sadness and that I don't sp still experience you know, anxiety and worry and sleepless nights and frustration and, 
anger and guilt and shame and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Every, everything that's on the color palette of human emotion I experience for sure. And uh, I think another important point on this topic is it's not nature versus nurture. Mm-hmm. It's always nature and nurture. Like ha- being heavily trained in genetics and spending a lot of time in that field, the uh, mental health conditions all have some percent genetic influence and then other factors like societal, cultural factors. Um, They say, and it's a little bit of a harsh saying, but uh, genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. Um, Or we're all born with this you know, genetic deck of cards or predispositions, like you might be born with a predisposition for an eating disorder like anorexia, but it might not show up unless you have uh, one or more of these, you know, risky environmental situations like a a ballet teacher who um, talked a lot about bodies in a shaming way and encouraged caloric restriction or or you got into this dangerous territory that was like that double whammy or perfect storm of environmental, cultural, societal, family, home, trauma factors combined with your unique genetic DNA and bam, you're in troubled waters. And, uh, and then you can also like with help sometimes get back out of that and into a place of wholeness. Yeah. Yeah. Your genetic code doesn't have to be fatalistic. It might be deterministic. It mm-hmm. might determine some of your traits, but it, it's not fatalistic. It's not, uh, yeah. you're not fated to develop these traits. And, you know, the, the research around epigenetics is really exciting and compelling and interesting that you can change gene, change gene expression with new experience. Yeah, one uh, thing that highlighted it to me, a professor in med school who I really liked our genetics professor, Lynn Jordy, he, uh, his mom was an identical twin. And I remember in a genetics lecture, he showed a picture of, you know, his mom, I believe who was the non-smoker and then her identical twin sister, who was the smoker of 20 years. And they looked, I don't know, 20 years different in age because of what genetics had done, but, uh, because of what environment had done on the same genome, I should say. Right, and, right. and having uh, identical twins, <clears throat> identical twin boys who are 12, I've been fascinated by this concept is that, uh, yeah, genetics do mean a lot, but they're definitely not everything. And if you look at mental health conditions, on average, most of them have a 50% heredi- heredi- heritability, like 50% of that, the, that uh, risk or or the development of that condition is due to genetics, the rest from all the other stuff. And, you know, if you look at things like autism, it's much higher on that percentage. Um, And some are lower, but in general, it uh, plays a very significant role. And it's important in taking the personal blame out of it, too. It's not, Yeah. uh, yeah, it's not like decades ago when the profession used to blame mothers <laughs> for people's mental health conditions. Yeah, the schizophrenogenic mom. Mm-hmm. Refrigerator mothers. Yeah. 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 Anything we can do to reduce shame. Uh, I mean, if you want to talk about purpose in life. Uh, I only really told the first half of my story. Like, you know, I, I certainly became a psychologist to figure out my own stuff, but I, I really, really want especially now that I'm doing so much better in my middle age, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, r- I really, really want to, to help other people reduce suffering in their lives. And I've, I've tried a lot of different ways. I've been a therapist. I've, I've conducted tens of thousands of therapy sessions in my short career so far. Um, I've talked to a lot of people and I've held space for uh, mm-hmm. people who were suffering um, and from a lot of different things in life. And I've certainly learned that there's no one size fits all fits all approach, uh, but I think learning the nature of the mind, creating awareness about the nature of your mind, is a really important substrate to mental health. That you know your thoughts are just thoughts, 
you know, Sam Harris has a lot of cool exercises. I know I keep talking him up. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe he'll pay me for it someday, but uh, <laughs> I'd love to talk to him about it someday. But let's get him on here. Get him Sam. on. Um, a lot of fun exercises about, you know, experiencing the nature of the mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, I won't steal any of his exercises here, but um, I really do think it's the foundation and, and like I say, the substrate of good mental health is learning that you don't have to over-identify with the stories in your mind. You don't have to over-identify with the stories handed down to you from an abusive parent, even a loving or overindulgent parent, from that ballet teacher you, you know, referenced mm-hmm. or from a culture that you were grown up in, that you grew up in. Uh, you can be a self-author. It reminds me of a Bruce Lee quote or idea that I think applies to purpose is, you know, he talked about how to learn martial arts. Like he has this cup of knowledge and wisdom and experience and practice of full of martial arts, like genius. And you have a cup full of something. (laughs) And in order for him to teach you martial arts, you have to empty your cup so he can then pour from his cup of knowledge into yours and same with purpose in order to really find your purpose you usually have to dump out the cup full of the purposes that aren't yours that have been um, stuck on you from society and Mm -hmm. conditioning and upbringing i love that yeah that's something i'll often ask my clients if uh, especially if we're doing parts work and trying to get a sense for different parts of themselves that have different roles is I'll ask them as they're saying something about themselves, is that yours? Mm-hmm. Who's else, who else, if it's not yours, whose might it be? Like, oh, I like that's, that. that's my dad's, or that's my football coach's. Or, then let that shit go. Yeah, yeah, let them have it. Let them carry it. You don't have to carry it anymore. And, you know, that can produce insights and then the hard work of, of letting go. Sometimes letting go is an instant psychedelics mm-hmm. seem to help with this they give you the those yeah. transformative experiences oftentimes though letting go is a process it's a process of slowly opening your hand as opposed to just dropping it yeah i like to think of it as peeling away layers mm-hmm. or you're chiseling away at this big block of you like the to find that real essence or statue of you that's inside you've got to chip away at it over time with with repeated effort and work yeah yeah it's uh and which again makes me think about this who am i question that we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast like your highest self your most authentic self your truest self i had an experience um with ketamine I was doing a training for a study that we're going to be doing this hospice study with Mm -hmm. Phil Wolfson where we got to experience the medicine ourselves and you were helping me kind of figure out what my intention for this experience would be and it was around self-identity and purpose and uh, I forget exactly that what you said I think it was something like um, show me who I am show me who I am that's what it was and I just clicked for me. And that's, so that's what I held in my consciousness as, I, as the medicine was taking effect. And I remember experiencing Steve as a construct. <laughs> and I don't know who the I was that was experiencing Steve. It was just awareness, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, and I had the thought like, this construct that is Steve, this sort of cloak that I've been wearing that is this identity, isn't so bad. You know, Steve is a construct, pretty good dude. Uh, he's good to his wife. He loves mm-hmm. his kids. He goes to work on time. You know, he's a, he's a good citizen. He, f- <laughs> he's, there's some good things about Steve. Good job, Steve. Yeah. Good job, Steve. It was fun to kind of see myself from a distance, but I could also see that it was a, a persona, mm-hmm. a mask that I could choose to wear or not choose to wear. And I had some, and wh- again, whoever the eye is, I don't know. Uh, but there's some volition here. I had some control over what I wanted to pick up and what I wanted to set down. I like uh, the idea of the spacesuit self that both, well, Ram Dass talks about Mm. and Tara Brock talks about, Mm -hmm. like taking off this spacesuit that we've had to put on because of all the abrasive stuff in the world as we navigate life. to really uh, open back up to the full experience of life. And it kind of brings us back to 
that Marcus Aurelius take on purpose is like, like first and foremost, your purpose is to really be present for what's here in your life right now and live that well, like live that fully. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some resources that um, we can point people to in the show notes about purpose and meaning. Um, one that just popped into my head is Jay Shetty's podcast on purpose. Mm-hmm. He wrote a book called, I think, think like a monk. Um, yeah. He's pretty popular on, on social media uh, around this topic. I like a lot of his stuff, not all of his stuff, but a lot of it. Um, I'll put that spark type personality mm-hmm. quiz in the show notes. Uh, probably Simon Sinek's TED Talk. It's a it's a popular one. The start with why. Um, any other thoughts, Reed, around this topic? So, a few others that we may or may not have, have touched on. One is uh, Joseph Campbell's "Follow Your Bliss." I just absolutely love mm-hmm. um, because it's based on this Sanskrit uh, saying, uh, "Sat Chit Ananda." Sat meaning beingness. Cheat meaning consciousness, and ananda meaning bliss. And he points out that uh, you may have no idea what your beingness is, and that's fine. Consciousness, that's confusing stuff too. Who who the hell knows right. like how to make sense of that? And that's fine. Um, but bliss, ananda, you can uh, you can go for that. You can find out what turns you on, what lights you up, what is alive in you. And you can follow that for now. And that uh, that's the path. Or it reminds me of a Terrence McKenna quote. Uh, one of my favorite of his is um, that uh, the magic happens when you uh, look into that scary abyss, and I'm butchering the quote, and you jump, mm. and you realize that at the bottom of that, it's a feather bed. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the other ones, have you heard of... Uh, uh, the Hedgehog Principle. I heard Brian Jim Brown Collins. talk about it. Yeah, he wrote a book uh, called uh, "From Good to Great." She may have even been talking to Jim Collins about it. Right. I think it was on a podcast or something. I heard them talk about it. Yeah, so it's based <clears throat> on this old uh, Greek philosopher's poem or uh, parable that a uh, hedgehog knows one thing really well, and a fox knows many things a little bit, mm. and he encourages being like a hedgehog in that, uh, you know, go deep on things. Like another way of looking at it is enlightenment is following one thing through all the way to the end. Mm. But Jim Collins paints these three overlapping circles, Venn diagram. And one of them is uh, what's your passion? What lights you up? Another is what are you really good at or what could you be the best at? And then the third circle is, what could actually make money? What right. drives your economic engine? And it's at the intersect of those three things that might be a useful place to think about what a job or career could be for you. Yeah, I've heard that the three overlapping circles thing before, and I really like it. It helps you zero in. And I've heard like sort of different terms for those three circles, but they basically you know, revolve around those three. Like uh, ikigai, a mm. Japanese word that uh, we don't need to get into now, but we can put it in the show notes, Mm -hmm. a Japanese concept of uh, like discovering your purpose um, that has, I think that one has four overlapping circles. Yeah. Yeah, lots of useful tools Mm -hmm. to explore what you would want to focus your energy and your time on in this world. Yeah. But But to sum it all up from my end, I would just say uh, we've talked about, follow your bliss um, but practically speaking what's one thing you could do today to do more of that I like that that's a good call to action um, yeah and uh, we have new microphones I forgot to mention that at the top oh. of the hour so folks if you thought the audio quality was better same one know. as uh, Joe Rogan thank you Joe yeah. Rogan if yeah. you're listening. <laughs> I'm sure he is. I'm sure he has all the time in the world to listen to our little podcast. But share with your friends, folks. We uh, we love doing this. If you find it useful, let us know. Um, comment on our YouTube channel, on our Instagram. What else? What other channels we have? We have an email address, and I'm struggling to remember it. I think it's um, 
psychfrontiers at novamind.ca. So if you want to email us questions, um, we, we want to do um, an Ask Me Anything Q&A episode here pretty soon where we can just uh, address listener questions. I think that'd be fun. That would be fun. So you can post them on any of the places we put this content, your questions, um, but also you can email them to us. Sound good? Follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. Thanks, Reed. Thank you for joining us today. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. This will help us get into the ears and faces of more people and help us put wind in the sails of the psychedelic medicine renaissance. Thanks for listening.